we are here to face the truth about ourselves, about this faith we love, and the ways it presently serves others in the world, as well as to open ourselves to ways it can, be, it can better and more joyfully reflect our potential and core values. We want to know the ways we are bound to one another, as well as to larger religious movements normally beyond our sight and vision. We say we are open and diverse, yet it is too easy to feel stuck in old paths and stubborn habits, reflecting not so much tradition as our comfort. We want to answer the call to service to a world that needs our message, our hope, and our revived energy. We are gathered to learn, to unlearn, to hear, and to move forward. Do we have any kids with us this morning? If so, would you come, please come up the center aisle, be very careful of the Rangoli, and we'll do our story for all ages. So, we have a really big day today in service for the grown-ups, which is pretty cool. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Have you ever, I mean, you, you look around you, right? And, and you notice that we don't all look the same, do we? We look different. Isn't that cool? Have you ever noticed somebody that was treated differently because they look different than somebody else? Yeah, I see Chloe nodding her head. Yeah, yeah. How does that make you feel when you see that? When you have seen that? Bless you, sweetheart. Does it make you feel angry? Does it make you feel sad? Does it make you feel that that's just not right? Is it right? To treat somebody different because they look different? To treat somebody badly because they look differently? So sometimes it's hard to know what to do when you see that happen. Has anybody here done anything when, you, when you've seen that happen or spoken up? Chloe, did you say something or do something? You were a friend to a child who fell down. I love that. I love that. So that's really important to be a friend to someone who needs you. And it's really important if somebody is treat, being treated unfairly or badly because they look different or act differently to say, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. I'll be your friend. Come with me. And the adults are going to talk about that a lot today. Sometimes it's hard to know what to do, and sometimes you don't know what to do, and sometimes it can feel really scary to do something, right? And that's the same for grown-ups. Sometimes grown-ups don't know what to do and don't know what to say and don't know if they should, if they should interfere. But that's what we're going to talk about in the service today while you guys are in Sunday school. You guys got this, right? You guys know this is not cool. You guys got this. So we're going to sing you to classes, okay? You're going to go through the doors in the dining room. So at this time, all people of color and indigenous people who choose to do so may move to the Daskam room for worship and caucusing. You may also stay in the sanctuary. It is your choice of where you would like to be this morning. After our service, there will be additional time for sharing and reflection in Sullivan 1, 2, and 3. There will be one discussion designated for people of color and indigenous people and one designated for white people. There will also be one large discussion to which everyone is welcome to attend. Please choose the space that best meets your personal needs. Here we are, 154 years after the Emancipation Proclamation and 54 years after the Civil and Voting Rights Acts 
And racism is alive and tenacious in America. True fact. Today in America, minority and low-income communities are disproportionately burdened with environmentally harmful practices. However, race alone, apart from economic class, a race alone is the most significant factor in terms of determining who is burdened by environmentally hazardous facilities or materials in their neighborhoods. Today, the United States has the largest prison population in the world. 2.2 million people are in jail or prison in America. And we know that people of color are arrested and convicted at disproportionately higher rates than the rates at which they commit crimes. And the profit-making prison endeavor crushes lives in so many ways. Just one of the important ways is it suppresses the voting rights of people of color so that they can help us choose a direction for our country. Today in our teaching, However, we are focusing predominantly on our own roles at the more local and individual levels, our own roles in racism. In America, I say racism is like groundwater, which we consume and distribute on a daily basis. It's very difficult, if not impossible, for most people to stay out of the cycles of contamination. Social psychologists have proven that most all of us have mind bugs, prejudices, and automatic associations about race which are deeply embedded in our cognitive systems. And too often, this leads to words and actions that are harmful to people of color. I want to say a word about faith-based language. We're blessed with a faith tradition which is free from dogma and creed. We're blessed that in the use of our religious language, we do not use a my way or the highway approach. I believe in the depths of my heart, there are a wide array of personal stories, perspectives, ideas, and words that can combine to play a role in a solutions. We can do this with respectful dialogue and free exchange of ideas. I encourage all of us to continue building beloved community in which whether or not, for example, you use the term white supremacy, we are working to draw each other in rather than putting each other down. I think this work is difficult, but I know it's necessary and worth it. In my life, too many times situations have been left not good enough. In high school, one of my best friends, Dwayne, was African-American, and the social segregation in our school was entrenched. Looking back now, I'm clear. I know I could have and should have done more to break across the line from my side of the white privilege to accompany and hang out and be friends with my buddy. And I lament that I stayed too often in my comfort zone. In my life today as a 49-year-old man, too often I see a similar pattern. It can be very micro and suavecito, as they say in Spanish, but I too often there's stuff that I could or should do Maybe I just don't, to break out of my comfort. What about you? What about you? The good news is that we all have the power of now to step up as individuals and communities. We all have the power now to step up. Too often, the denomination and the congregation have not completed our promise to be fully inclusive to people and help meet a wide array of spiritual needs and aspirations of the people who 
might be participating in our religion. I'm committed to helping lead this congregation move from where we are now, where we are doing many good things, and we can build on that towards more fully living out our aspirations. And I'm deeply grateful for the brave people of color in our congregation, in our association, in the Black Lives UU group who are helping to lead. I know as a white privileged male, I have a lot of blind spots and there's many things I do not know. No matter where you are on your journey right now, I'm asking you to stay open with a heart or open your heart and listen compassionately. We're going to have chances, including today after the service, where there will be groups where you can share honestly and respectfully with one another. I want our church to raise up our anti-racism effort to the most dedicated, effective way we can muster. Blessings be to you all. Some of the terms pertinent to this teaching are racism, white privilege, white fragility, and the system of white supremacy. Let's take a look at some definitions that are currently popular among leading anti-racism educators. The first is racism. The dictionary defines racism as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Sociology defines racism as a set of attitudes, beliefs, and practices that are used to justify that one racial category is somehow superior or inferior to others. A security guard following a person of color in a store is an example of racism. Using yearbook photos for young white men versus police mugshots for young black men for the same crime, burglary, covered by the same reporter on the same day on the same TV channel is an example of racism. The Holocaust is an example of racism. White, excuse me, white privilege. White privilege is a set of unearned rights, favors, and advantages bestowed upon white people, but withheld from people of color. According to Nietzsche Lisa Cole, it is important to recognize that no form of privilege comes without its counterpart, oppression. For example, white people are given the privilege of having a trusting, safe relationship with law enforcement in a society where people of color have to be fearful of calling police even when they are in danger. The opioid epidemic versus the war on drugs is another example of white privilege versus racial oppression. Robin D'Angelo describes white fragility as a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. Examples of white fragility include responses such as, but no one in my family ever owned slaves, or all lives matter, or not all white people are racist, The system of white supremacy. 
Ed Brockenborough from the University of Pennsylvania writes that the system of white supremacy is one that privileges white people at the expense of others. According to Tim Weiss, an anti-racism educator, racism is like the generic product name, while white supremacy is the leading brand. As you can see from the iceberg picture on the screen above you, the swastikas and the KKK are just a tip, it's just the tip of a massive iceberg. What you see below the line are all still examples of white supremacy. Why are we being asked to use the term white supremacy? A term that comes with so much historic and emotional baggage why not use the word racism? Better yet, why not create a new word? Surely we can do that. When I wrote this bit yesterday morning, I did some self-reflection. I asked myself, who am I speaking for? More importantly, who am I speaking as. I have no doubt ever in my mind who I'm speaking for, but today I stand before you as someone who grew up in a faraway land with the privilege of caste, class, financial well-being, and education. That is a huge stack. Today, I put this on. If somebody saw me yesterday, I was in my trousers and t-shirt helping. But today I put this on with a purpose. Today this is a prop. One of the reasons UU congregations are being asked to do teachings at short notice and use the term white supremacy is precisely because it is disruptive and uncomfortable. Such inner turbulence can lead to reflection, and from reflection, real change and growth can happen. There is another important reason to use the term white supremacy system, and I stress the word system. We are in 2017, and yet black and brown lives continue to be in danger and not necessarily from white supremacists. When a random person follows another in spite of official advice not to, and then takes a life, and then the law absolves him of any culpability, you know, for people of color, it does feel like a system of white supremacy. In such an environment, an average person is just as scary as someone in a white hood carrying a tiki torch. I know there are those who will counter that the killer was not a white man. True, he was biracial. But just ask yourself what the outcome would have been if the victim had been a white teenager instead of Trayvon Martin. When oppressed people ask the privileged to use language that they feel best defines their lived reality, it is somewhat like being asked to take off your shoes in a friend's house. You love those comfy shoes and you really don't want to take them off. But you love your friend. You cherish your friendship. More than anything else, you understand that this is very important for them. As times change, the meanings and usage of words change too. Yesterday, it was white privilege. 
Today it is white supremacy. Tomorrow it may be something else that makes us cringe even more. But today, as Kent said earlier, today we have a choice. We can choose to stand in solidarity against a centuries old systemic problem that denies safety to our friends and family of color. Today we can choose to lay the groundwork for a future when we can stand together and truthfully claim we are beloved community. At that point, it won't matter one bit what term is being used, and that is something to look forward to. Thank you. That was a lot. How are you? Sometimes this work is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's inspiring. It's educational. It's difficult. And it's necessary. It's all of the above. As we go through this today, I ask you to remember one thing. You are loved. You are all loved. And at this moment, let's, let's take a minute to kind of settle in and think about what we've just heard. I'm going to give you a little reflection to start the process. This is not a time of quick solutions or fancy talking. This is a slow precision. This is a prayer for peace. We're new at this endeavor, new at listening, new at hearing, new at taking enough time to honestly receive one another's stories. What is done cannot be undone. What is done next must be done with care. We gather because we are hopeful, because we have visions and dreams of a brighter future. May the strength of this time together help us to walk forward. May the wisdom of this experience help us to know our path. May we have the courage to return as often as necessary until our way is clear. May we have the perseverance together to see it through, and may we cause it to be so. Amen. So where do we go from here? Now what? This is not new work. You've heard that said. This is work that's been going on for a while. It's work that has been accelerated by some things that have happened in our denomination in 2017. It doesn't seem possible that all of that has happened in the last seven months. What we're going to share with you now are the things that are happening at the denomination level, at the congregation level, and some suggestions for the personal level. I'll begin with the denomination. In a special message issued this fall, our new UUA president, Susan Frederick Gray, remarked that we have an extraordinary opportunity to live the most deeply universalist aspect of our theology and to begin to overcome the limitations of our history. Our commitment to raise and invest $5.3 million for Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism recognizes that centering black leadership is crucial to building multiracial, multicultural communities and to supporting justice work that is free from white supremacy and paternalism. As a faith denomination, we are at the leading edge in addressing our own history of upholding white supremacy and working at dismantling it. We are mending a long broken promise 
to the black lives within our denomination. This fall, I invite you to explore how we are now practicing our promise. As Unitarian Universalists, we are called to examine our history and to discover how we have benefited from the lives of black people and to share what we learn. Those were Susan's words. That notion of practicing our promise will be realized in a special service called The Promise and the Practice, which we will hold here at USG, along with approximately 1,000 other congregations, on November 12th. What is this promise and the practice? It's not another teach-in. It's a celebration of our shared commitment to live into a new chapter in the story of our UU faith. It's designed to create a soul deep space of feeling and experiencing the power of this moment in our UU story. The promise and the practice worship material center the voices and stories of black UUs over the last 200 years. In so doing, the entire worship service will call upon the lived experience of black religious professionals today as current and sacred text, inviting white UUs to bear witness to the pain as a place of connection and in recognition of all that's been lost in our tradition. There is also Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. You've heard that mentioned. It's called Blue. Blue provides information, resources, and support for black UUs and works to expand the role and visibility of black UUs within our faith. In addition to creating programming like these teach-ins, which is happening at hundreds of congregations worldwide right now, Blue offers anti-racism workshops and resources as well as pastoral support and virtual worship opportunities for black UUs. At General Assembly this year, the Board of Trustees of the Unitarian Universalist Association voted to support the work of Blue and committed that $5.3 million in funding that Susan referenced. There's also DRUM, which is the Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. DRUM has been in existence for more than 20 years. It is a cohort of multi-generational UU people of color working to create innovative contributions, contributions toward the creation of multicultural UUism. This group works to amplify and cross-pollinate the talents and skills of its members to create liturgical, cultural, and other resources to decenter whiteness within Unitarian Universalism. The Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association is highly engaged and dedicated to this work. At our annual gathering that we call Ministry Days in June, we held three days of meetings on this topic. We've had a variety of national webinars and materials that have been distributed to us. Week before last, Kent and I participated in a call with ministers all across the country to discuss this very issue. At the local chapters, ministers are engaged in this work. Kent and I are members of the Priestly Kingsbury chapter of Unitarian Universalist Ministers. At our last meeting, we focused specifically on this work and shared stories and experiences and hopes and fears and guilt and shame and inspiration and dedicated ourselves to doing this work. Seminaries are involved. I am a student at Meadville Lombard Theological School. We host the FAS Collaborative which, if you're not aware, operates Beloved Conversations, which is a workshop and program to help people have these kinds of difficult conversations. All of my classwork for the three years I've been at school includes a component of dismantling white supremacy and anti-racism work. 
Star King is doing the same thing. Meadville and Star King are the two UU seminaries. Harvard, Yale, Andover Newton, Princeton, Lutheran, Lancaster, they are all doing this work to create religious professionals who will emerge from seminary ready and focused. As you can imagine, there are also a number of community organizations that are also doing this work. There is Black Lives Matter. There are uh, groups such as Indivisible. There's power. There are many groups in the community doing this work. And the denomination is doing all that it can to support them as well in this effort. It is um, encouraging to hear how many resources there are at the national level. I think it's, um, as a member, I'm a member of the ministry executive team and I'm uh, happy to tell you, I think it is a significantly new day in our congregation in the sense that we have leaders at the board level, we have leaders at the uh, lay level, we have um, a new, I would think, a renewed determination uh, to be more effective in becoming a multiracial congregation and work more effectively in the community. Um, so you may know this, but let me mention a few things that have happened. Um, on September 26, the board of our congregation met, and there are several board members here on the, uh, on the podium and, and in our congregation, and they uh, endorsed uh, Reverend Kent's proposal that we set up a standing working group task force uh, to coordinate anti-racism efforts among USG organizations, meaning all the parts of USG, to ensure a common focus and a plan for the year. One of the projects that task force was to bring us together today, and there will be many other opportunities. Uh, the board went on to uh, uh, basically uh, decide that the composition of the task force would be bring the whole congregation together. Much of the great work on anti-racism thinking and action in our congregation has been done by dedicated small groups. And the racism committee is the one that most of you are familiar with. I think what the leaders of our congregation that we have elected and we support are saying it's time to make it all of our effort. Um, and then uh, you heard uh, part of Kent's uh, thinking two weeks ago, but also today. But this is from the statement that he and um, Susan Smith, our board chair, this is what they released uh, through the email, but you may not have seen it. Racism, I'm quoting, racism is the groundwater that contributes to substandard education, mass incarceration, that encourages hate group violence, such as we saw in Charles, Charlottesville, and that too often ignores the microaggressions, the casual words that may not be malicious in intent, yet have the power to wound. As USG members, we reaffirm our commitment to vigorous anti-racism efforts at the personal, congregational, and broader community levels. Now, like some of you, I've been around USG for a couple of decades, and I don't think we've ever had as clear statements from our really broad leadership of our congregation about this. And I think this is a positive, I think this opens up great opportunities for all of us. So it's highly premature for me as an individual to recommend next steps at the congregation level because I think we're at the beginning of a process, a renewed process. But let me share a few of my thoughts about some future steps anyway. First, I think let's participate 
all of us. If you can stay today, good for the discussions. If you can't stay today, make sure you participate in other future discussions that are being organized by our task force. Um, one of those opportunities, I think I have it right, uh, Debbie, is the uh, on October 29th at 2 p.m. at noon. That's right. 12 to 2, the task force that Debbie and Eli um, co-chair is going to have an open meeting. So they're inviting anyone who's interested to be there too. So that's one opportunity. There'll be others. The second thing I hope as a congregation as a whole is that we will really work hard at having dialogue, work hard at really listening, and work hard at searching for common ground. Um, lots of experience I've had, and I think many of you have had, when there are difficult issues, writing emails or going on social media about what's wrong with the other person's view, how they're mistaken, how they're off base, is not the way we build positive effort. So I would encourage us all to seek out and to initiate the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the small group conversations. Um, I am one of those who, the, I'm listening hard, I was listening hard to the discussion of the term white, white supremacy, who, who does not agree that it's the, that's the accurate term to define at this point in history our denomination as a culture or our congregation. However, I'm not looking forward to debate about the terms. I'm looking forward to a dialogue, a discussion with people who feel whatever term we use, there's a problem here. There's problems in our congregation, there's problems in our neighborhood, there's problems certainly in our country. And that we need to be more aware, we need to build the kind of unity that we can have a positive effect here in our congregation and in the community. Finally, I hope as a congregation we can pick up on a, a strong suggestion two weeks ago that uh, Reverend Kent shared with us. And that was to move toward being as specific as possible, identify those practices, those policies, those behaviors that we feel are blocking us from being the kind of beloved community we so much want to be. And the beloved community where people of color feel respected, honored, welcome, and feel very good about participating in. Similarly, I hope if you have ideas, feelings, perceptions about what is blocking us from being a much more effective congregation when we step out into the community and work on uh, changes in the community that really do affect the lives of us all, but particularly people of color. We've got a lot of different initiatives going, as you know, locally and at the state level. But could we be more effective? What's preventing us from being more effective and identifying those? The reason we need, I hope, I hope that you agree that we need to be specific, is when we get specific, then we get down to action plans. We can say, what are we going to do about this? So. We've been awakened again by calls from our UUA leaders and from our leadership groups here in our church to focus, to become more effective, and yes, more persistent in our anti-racism work. May we take these and related steps together with the belief that we can indeed reach our common goals. Like Dennis, I'm also a member of the ministry executive team, and I have been a grateful member of USG for a total of, of 11 years. I had a brief sabbatical in, in between them. Okay, so where do we go from here? Let's change the we to I. Where do I go from here, each one of us? You've heard some things this morning, 
perhaps a new slant on something old, perhaps something new, maybe something you question. Perhaps your curiosity is piqued. I encourage you to look at the handout in your order of service. There you will find some resources for further reading and learning. You can find some of these resources at the Ending Racism Committee Lending Library. These issues we are facing are complex, challenging, and profound. We have to dig deep within and look at the untruths we have been taught and conditioned to believe. However painful, this work is deeply spiritual. It is soul work. Gandhi suggested, be the change you wish to see in the world. Have conversations, ask questions, but most of all, listen deeply. This is a crucial time for the Unitarian Universalist Association, for USG, for each of us. What will be said of our legacy and stewardship 20 or 30 years from now? Will USG be on the side of the ark, bending toward justice? As another giant what once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter, Martin Luther King. And so, I ask you, if not now, when? Today's teaching couldn't have happened without the work of many, many dedicated people, without the commitment of many people. We've heard a lot today. We've shared some information. We've had time for reflection. We've talked about where we can go from here. We've each thought about our own individual path forward from here. And now is the time to cement that intention. So I'd like to ask all of the members of the board, the ministry executive team, the staff, the Ending Racism Committee, and the White Privilege Committee, and Treva will be here in spirit for membership, to come forward to read the leader's portion of our responsive reading with me. Something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening in our world. And you know, if I were standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt and I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through or rather across the Red Sea, through the wilderness on toward the promised land. I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus, and I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assembled around the Parthenon, 
and I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discussed the great and eternal issues of reality. I would go on, even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire, and I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I am named had his habitat, and I would watch Martin Luther as he tacked his 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg. I would come up on even 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now that's a strange statement to make, because the world is all messed up and the nation is sick. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. And wherever they are assembled today, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. Please rise in body or spirit as you are able and join in singing our closing hymn, our only hymn today, number 1017, Building a New Way. <laughs>